Hi everyone, how are you going? Hope you're having a fantastic day. I'll say good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. And hello to all my subscribers, non subscribers, trolls, bots, and yes, those lurkers alike. Okay, Plane of Jars. This was a comment was left in the last video I made, so to check it out. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. It got me, what started was Dresden, how they bombed the shit out of Dresden. Uh, it just got me looking at all the other places that were done and this was a comment left so I'm going to share it. The explosive implications of archaeology at last most puzzling site. I'm following Belgian archaeologist Julie van den Bro around last remote Zing Korang Providence. I apologize for saying it wrong. We're inspecting giant ancient vessels which are scattered through rice paddies, forests and hilltops at more than 60 sites across what is known as the Plain of Jars. Archaeologists think the jars were mortuary containers, perhaps 2,000 years old, but no one knows for sure their precise age or who built them. They are swathed in mystery and surrounded by unexploded bombs. It's like Cambodia. Didn't they leave a lot of bombs laying around? I remember in the 90s, um, on the news all the time, there were people blowing up in Cambodia. And I it, it's just... Yeah, something's off. So, the Zang province is one of the most heavily bombed places on earth between 1964 and 1973 in the united states dumped four billion pounds of bombs on the country in a secret war against pathlet lay and north of these communists up to a third term of them never ex up to a third of them never exploded and don't forget what pol pot did as well pol pot i think a lot of people have forgotten about what he did um, they live on the land today, while generally safe to tread upon, buried unexploded ordinances can trigger when an erratic fuse is inadvertently triggered. The earth around here is dangerous to farmers ploughing fields, children stalking uh, buffalo out to graves, and archaeologists. The jars are huge, up to nine feet tall, the largest weighing 14 tons. Most of the most of carved sandstone, others granite, conglomerate, and calcified coral. Some are round, others angular, and a few have discs that appear to be lids. Tools and human remains found inside around the jars suggest their use and manufacture spanned centuries. The bulk of the material dates from 500 BC to AD 800, and additional carbon dates expected this summer. Archaeologists are certain the Plain of Jars is one of Southeast Asia's most important archaeological sites, but it is one with more questions than answers. French archaeologist Madeleine Colony pioneered a research in 1930s. She found jars with cremated human remains and a nearby cave with burnt bones and ash. She speculated the cave was a crematorium and the jars were mortuary vessels and the fields were ancient cemeteries. Today, more than 2,000 jars have been identified in the province. These archaeological treasures sit on the world's one of the world's most porous regions. That's why Van den Bre, a UNESCO, consultant from Hong Kong-based archaeological assessments is here. She hopes to turn the Plain of Jars into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. UNESCO lay project to safeguard the Plain of Jars aims not only to protect the vessels but to rehabilitate this remote province by clearing the bombs, restoring the agricultural lands and promoting tourism. A speciologist in geo-archaeology geo with a decade of experience in Asia it worked in Laos on six week stints for four years now, in conjunction with the Lay government and geographer from Bangkok. The project includes training Laotians to recover, record and store archaeological material, create a precise map of the jar fields and identify key areas for preservation and tourist development. The project also enlists local villagers to help with the task and involves a British-based mines advisory group, a government organisation hired to remove explosives from most popular jar sites. Some dubbed the Plain of Jars the world's most dangerous archaeological site, and she readily agrees. While archaeologists occasionally encounter unexploded ordinances in war torn countries and military testing grounds around the world, perhaps no archaeological site is as contaminated as the Plain of Jars. Two archaeologists conducted limited ex excavations in the 90s without instance, incidents, but that's just luck, she says. I've come home from surveying, I thought I'm happy to be getting in the car and coming home. Probably happy to be having feet. Some of the old ones there. 
So, my husband Jerry and I visited Zhang in 1998. Back then, the capital, Fronsaven, was a Wild West sort of town with the main street of mud, on and off again water, and equally unreliable electricity. You could count three on three fingers the tourists arriving each day. We stayed in a dimly lit guest house with a lobby full of bomb casings, mortar shells, grenades and guns. Back then we knew UXO still polluted the ground, but we didn't know the jar sites remained riddled with bombs or that unexplained audiences continue to kill villagers every week in Zhangkong. We didn't know our guest house displayed four live bombs. No worries now. Meg removed them. We arrived in Furnace Savian this time. It's still dusty still a dusty cow town, but the nights are ablaze with fluorescent, cheap restaurants and guest houses line the street. Tourists from all over the world fill them. So Vanda bro drives us half an hour outside town over a bone rattling road to a wooden house where Mag bases his operation. They're the British ones. And there we meet Stuart Broom, the jo jovial ex-military man from Australia who heads the clearance team. The staff are about two dozen strong, are celebrating, beer is flowing, music is snuffing a week ahead of schedule. They've just finished clearing jar sites 1, 2 and 3, the most popular tourist sites, each with a f within a 45 minute drive. Visitors can now safely explore these sites, provided they stick within the mag's red and white concrete markers. Tourists come unaware how dangerous it is, she says. The jars have attracted travellers as long as last has. Many recent video visitors never knew they were crossing contaminated land. Some local guides mistakenly told their guests it was all safe and cleared long before it was. Here, the ordnance problem isn't visible, just, just as neighbouring Cambodia, where the landmines have left thousands of amputees and unexplained orders and blows. It will just kill you. And they are nasty. No limbs lost, no person left, nothing to illustrate the danger. There is no reliable tally of unexploded ordnance victims. The experts hear at least one a week. They'll admit that it's probably low. Broom tells us of 11 accidents the week before we met that we know of. There were four two weeks before that that we know of. But later we learn of eight more for a total of 12 that we know of. Is an oft used qualifier here. Meg's clearance records are staggering. Since the work started in July 2004, the team has successfully removed and destroyed 127 pieces UXO, cleared 6 acres, virtually, visually searched 55 acres and found 31,814 pieces of scrap metal. And that's just site one. Finding explosives using a variety of metal detectors covering 15 inches to 7 foot swaths using a scrupulous task. Workers move back and forth, up and down the grid of rope lanes, detectors in hand. Each signal is marked with a red chip, and each chip is investigated by a technician with a shovel. They always dig down and towards the source. Starting half a foot back, we don't dig on the top, Broom explains, because that could cause the UXO to blow. The UXO that is safe to move is stored until each Friday when MAG detonates the entire week's cache. It's really similar archaeology and bomb disposal. Huh. That comment, yeah, very similar. She explains, when a maid clears the site, all the scrap metal is popped into a bucket. Broom is first to peek at the findings and she's quick to foe. Both are curious about the bucket because its contents can tell a story about the site, either through bomb fragments or metal artifacts. Broom and I examine the bucket one morning, a projectile fragment, cartridge cases, barbed wire, cans, I pick up a piece. It's a cartridge case from a recoilless rifle, he says. He ogles an aluminium bit. I think it's part of a rocket mortar. It was all found in the parking lots of Site 3. These are just amazing. I didn't even know they existed. Uh, thank you to the person leaving that comment. One bright Saturday, Van den Bra leads us through Site 1, pointing to hundreds of jars scattered over parched grasslands and rolling hills just outside town. A few cows graze through the area, western tourists trundle downhill, ignoring the mag markers. Uh, Laotian children stumble upon uphill doing the same. It will take time for people to learn. We walk from jar to jar, each in small clusters. Van Bernberg has only has permission to survey on site. All our excavations are connected to the mag ev evacuations, she explains. We don't have permission to evacuate for research. 
She suspects the ground below our feet is rife with archaeological information, perhaps tools, burials, urns, bones, charcoal that could be more precisely pin a date or conclusions on the historical background of the site, but Vandenbrough is here solely to help prepare the sites for nomination for the World Heritage status. Taking inventory, mapping the jars, creating a database, working with Meg to provide a bonus, the chance to see below the surface while they dig, we collect information. In fact, those jars have not been studied much. Archaeological last is the most terra incognita. Terra incognita, writes Thongasa. The country's only certified archaeologist and one of a few have excavated the jars. He, like Vandenberg, relies heavily on Colony, who documented her findings in two massive volumes titled The Megaliths of Upper Laos. Seventy years later, they remain the primary source on the jars. That's strange, just to have one archaeologist to it. Plenty of jars seems to be con coincide with the Korot Plateau in Thailand and the North Shah Hills of India, where jar burials have also been found. Those were transformative times, some 2,000 years ago, of archaeological advancement, metal manufacturing, religious expansion, widening Asian trade routes, and the social uh, persecutors to urbanization. She speculated the plain of jars lay at an important intersection of trade routes that stretched perhaps from India to Vietnam. She found beads and bronze Iron tools, the cave she discovered on site one has blackened walls and two chimney openings that signaled, signaled to her that bodies had been cremated there. But how do they know the bodies? That's here before the place went inside the jars. Japanese archaeologist Il Nita evacuated some of the jars in 94 and Thongster followed a couple of years later. Both found burial plots containing human remains in bones among the jars as both concluded the sites were used for secondary burials. Yeah, that's what I think. Someone found them and yeah, made a use for them. Van den Bra wonders about the archaeological discoveries over time. Colonini found burned bones. Thongsa and Nita found unburned. Did they stem from different periods? Were they half-hearted cremations? Seems the deceased were either buried or put in a stone jar for deflashing. Then the bones were either cremated or placed directly into an urn and buried. But the question nags her. Nita found an urn with human bones and teeth beneath a, beneath a jar in site one. It looked to him like a 10th century pottery from the Khmer Empire. And he con con concluded the stone jar directly above the urn could be no older than that. If so, the date that would make the jar... 1,000 years younger than previously thought. Don't forget they added a 1,000 years to the history. Vandenbrod doesn't dispute this date, but thinks the jar sites were occupied and used over many centuries. And yeah, they probably were. Neto, Nita, who returned to Japan, has sent his volumes, sorry for saying these wrong, to Vandenbrod, but she has not been able to reach him since. She has spoken with Thongasa several times, but he now studies in Australia, and their work on the jars has yet to coincide. He declined to be interviewed for the article. Furthermore, many of Cloney's artefacts have disappeared from Laos over the years, so Vernonberg plugs along with what she has. She questions villagers, hoping they'll know something about the jars, but they always return to the same legend of ancient king named Korn Chung, an epic battle against an evil enemy, and a grand victory celebrated with copious qualities of alcohol some 1,500 years ago. The jars, they say, stored tons of lao, lao, a hemming rice whiskey is still enjoyed today. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of, um, like wine, if it's an old trade route, you know, did they have market holders along the way? Or was it like, um... Yeah, something's not right. Vandenbrough doesn't discount this theory. Like any good Belgian, she likes her beer. When people die in Belgium, it always involves a lot of drinking, she says. So I can understand lots and lots of lao on a gravesite, though she doubts the jars were fermenters. 
As we continue entering Site 1, she points towards the zigzag of war area trenches to the bottom of bottoms of bomb craters where villagers dug for scrap metal to a cavity in the hillside once used as a tank position. They would have been repurposed over the years. Oh, hey Michael. Um, yeah, they definitely would have been repurposed. She points to broken jars, cause of a consideration. They have been bombed and looted. Cows rub them, tourists climb them, trees straddle them, villagers fashion the jars into water troughs or knife sharpness between the war, cattle, people, trees, and we are losing a lot, she says. The weaker the jars get, the quicker they topple. So she has a few plans. A bamboo fence will enclose some of the jars to deter the cows, but neither, she does not want an overly restricted situation. After all, part of the charm is that people can walk freely among the jars but the cows must go, and so some of the trees. People come up here for a picnic, she says. It's not just ex it's just not acceptable. We do don't want people to stay on the site. We just want them to visit. In fact, Vandenborough wants more visitors, about 9,000 to travel to Site 1 last year from all over the world, but only a third of those reach Site 2, and fewer yet Site 3, which lies further outside town. Vandenbra helps tourism can spur local arrogant comedy, which affords most people less than a dollar a day. Site run is run by the government, but at other sites, surrounding villages get half of the 7,000 kip, 70 cent entrance fee. Vandenbra hopes new jar sites will open soon, though they're not safe, of course. They haven't been cleared of UXOs. Funding for MAG's role in the project ended with clearance for sites 1, 2, and 3. Vandenberg is a shoestring operation. Evident as soon as we enter her office, it sits on the second floor of a wooden building, a rustic workroom with the back half stock stocked with shelves and metal trunks. Her face brightens as she reveals her treasures, collecting from various sites. Packed in plastic bags and acid-free paper, pottery shards, stone aids, a bugle, presumably French or Chinese, left in war-era trench, Small Buddha, six metal knives, and tools made of flaky white stone. Then she beckons to the back, smiling, our pride and joy. There, wrapping gingerly in ace bandages and foam, packed in wooden crates, are two urns found at Site 1, trench dug during an unexploded ordnance clearance. They are about two feet tall, brown, and coated in resin, and they look like bombs, which is what Vandenberg was told when she took one of the hot to the hospital for x-rays. They also resemble the urn Nita found with bones. Vandenberg's pots are stuffed with soil, too fragile to empty, but the x-rays reveal a possible bone fragment inside. Someday she'll figure a way to get out the contents. But she doesn't have any money right now. Ah, oh. UNESCO is paying 275000 for the project, but that includes overhead and fundraising costs. Only about half of that amount reaches Vandenberg in the field. 275000 is a lot of money where people live on less than a dollar a day. That money could go a long way over there. So a young boy training to be a monk stands next to a jar at Site 3. A few years back, project members started going village to village asking, Do you have jars? If so, they could attract tourists and money. Vandenberg still crisscrosses the province, greeting villages and setting up for hours on wooden floors and homes on stilts. She's accompanied by government officials and the meetings require exhaustive explanations what the jars mean to archaeology, why tourists are interested and how tourism might help villages. The jars are valuable relics, she explains, and UNESCO hopes to protect them as a world heritage, a status afforded to a few. Why are they so hell-bent on making it a uh, World Heritage Site? Like, you look at the other places around the world. Vill villagers usually don't think much about the jars. They're just rocks in the background. But once they get the idea that the jars are really important, they start talking about new jars. They have always been there, but no one realised they mattered. We attended one of these meetings in the Ne Zetong village, an hour's drive of Perseverian. Chate Munti, an elder, says the villagers here attribute healing qualities to the jars and they pour jar water over the heads of ill children. Many years ago, he says, village monks rolled the jar to the temple to use f 
for water basin, but many people quickly grew sick, so the monks returned the jar to its original site. When all the stories have been told, we gather for a feast of cabbage soup, boiled chicken, green papa salad, and a tray of fried innards and a congealed duck blog, which we forego. But what comes next? No one can avoid the la la. Round and room. Round and round the room it goes, several sherry glasses of fire water offered to an ancient tradition of hospitality and celebration. That meeting is a prelude to a long hike into a survey site near Hum village called Ban Paco, a place with many jars but little in the way of tourism development. It's half an hour trudge downhill until the trail crosses a rickety bamboo bridge and makes a sharp upward turn. We see miles of blue-green mountains in the hot haze. I'm not tired, Vandenberg pants. After another 90 minutes hiking through the sweltering jungle, I'm just dead. Ben Fanko is a collection of wooden homes, most of with earthen floors, thatched roofs and cluster bomb castings for planters and feed troughs. The one-room schoolhouse has a bell made from a bomb scrap and the walls are decked with posters showing children's proper behaviour around our unexploded ordinances. I don't call children kids. Um, to me, kids are goats, baby goats, and I've never called my children kids. It's just something I, I don't say. I, I believe when you say stuff, it affects everything, and I'm not calling my children baby goats. So, don't stake your buffalo to the ground. Tie it to a tree instead. Never touch an unexploded ordinance. Tell an adult if you see something suspicious. How are you going <laughs> to... Okay. <clears throat> Further uphill, another half hour away, there are nearly 400 jars toppled in the forest, covered in mosaics of green and white lichens. The tween quickly gets into business, stretching a tape measure from jar to jar, measuring, measuring, and photographing details. We spend two days among these ancient vessels, and the team works diligently amid scrub brush trees, avoiding thoughts of unexploded ordinances. Nothing here has been cleared. It's amazing, these jars sitting in the woods on a windy hill. I catch Vandenberg in a moment of reflection, and she offers a pensive sigh. They're beautiful, aren't they? It is, really. The only imaginable comment. The beauty of these magnificent jars is indisputable. Their value to archaeology is certain. These things are known. But for now, little else about the jars is. So, I want to say thank you for the person leaving that comment. That was just amazing. Mm, just unreal. February 2016, the team conducted its initial digs at Site 1 during an unusual frigid stretch of winter weather. One Windy morning, archaeologist Louise Schroen of Monash University called across the ground, still damp after drenching rain into a pit only 6.5 by 6.5 feet. She grabbed a trowel and began to work. Besides two Polish researchers, one of whom was Joanna Kosker from the University of... I can't say that, sorry. Please don't rain, she said. Yesterday it was just crazy. It was like a swimming pool in here. The three scraped away the red earth using brushes and tiny picks designed for position. Their work centred on a round object on the packed dirt floor, which Cosa had found the day before. They worked meticulously to remove what lay beneath. At first, the object resembled of a rock smoothed on top and caked with mud on the underside. But it was not a rock at all. Rather, it was a small orb of a bone, part of a fragile human skull which they later named Burial 5. The skull was surrounded by other bits of bone, so manoeuvring around the trench among the delicate remains was difficult and physically demanding. After five minutes in the same position, you was so stiff she can't move, she said. Uh, she was just in layers of hats and jackets. Later that day, team uncovered fragments from a second skull and skull fragments and a mandible of a child. Multiple burials in the same place are pretty fascinating, says Project Director Dougal O'Reilly of the Australian National University. Especially when up to this time scholars scuttling, studying the area had found so few. There you go. How cool is that? Wow. And it always goes back to the giants, doesn't it? Lay legends 
tell of a race of giants who inhabited the area and who were ruled by a king named Kon Shang, who fought a long and an ultimately vicious battle against an enemy. He supposedly created the jars to brew and store huge amount of Layla, means alcohol, means rice beer or rice wine in the jars to celebrate his victory. Another local story states that the jars were moulded from natural materials including clay, sand, sugar, animal products and a large type of stone mix, geopolymer. This led to locals to believe that the cave at Site 1 was actually a kiln and the jars were fired there and were not actually hewn from stone. That would make sense, wouldn't it? 262 million anti-personnel cluster bombs. 80 million of these did not explode. That is a lot, isn't it? Wow. A lot. Oh, look at their beautiful traditional dress costs, like what they wear. Absolutely beautiful. I love how there's modesty and respect. And you look at what Westerners wear today for clothes, and it's just absolutely disgusting. They might as well just walk up the street naked. Plane of jars at site one. Very unique, aren't they? It's just wow. Unreal. See, my um, granddad was in uh, in uh, World War Two. Uh, he went over to the Middle East and um, Jerusalem, and then over Africa. And he said he just couldn't make out the destruction. He didn't know why they would just. Yeah, he could never work out why there was so much destruction and death going on with it. It's just you unreal. Look how big these are. They're not just little jars sitting on the ground. I always get very suspicious when either the British, American or Australian government are involved in something. Almost like a cover-up. Very well made, even a little handle on them. And if you're still with me, thank you for your support. Appreciate it, and yeah, guys, I'm okay. Um, just spending time with family. Family is really important to me, so... Time is short, very short. Um, my mum hasn't been too well. She's okay now, but uh, it looks like my stepdad's got to have some cataracts removed on the 24th of February. So, um, yeah, I mean, my dad is also having problems with his heart. So, yeah, I'm just spending time with my family. So, wherever you are in the world, thanks for watching. Raise your vibrations. Get out of the low alpha hum. Yeah. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye now.